Innovating Education Learning World in association with WISE, an initiative of Qatar Foundation. This week we are in Cairo to take a closer look at how the Arab Spring has affected education in Egypt. Politically, the dust is still settling and the country's first ever democratically elected leaders are still finding their feet. In education, many teachers and students are metaphorically holding their breath as they wait for change. During Hosni Mubarak's regime, education faced multiple problems and many of the people who took to the streets demanding change were students and teachers. So did they get what they wanted or just more of the same? And what are the new government's plans? There are still echoes of last year's revolution in Egypt's schools. This young woman is saying, glorious are people who seize their freedom. The political change has been welcomed by many Egyptian students, but the future of education is uncertain. Discontent with the system under Mubarak pushed many students and teachers onto the streets during the revolution. But now, even with a new administration in charge, these youngsters believe nothing much has changed. We have our own educational project. We've explored 10 countries in which education wasn't good, and now it is. The problem is the officials themselves. We met them, we met the education minister, and the education committee in the Shura. Unfortunately, they would listen, but never do anything. Education officials who are still deaf to student demands have their own reform plans. The Islamist-led government that took office a few months ago is still finding its feet. But the minister in charge says they've put forward a rebuilding plan to improve education in Egypt. We are on the way to improving the level of state and experimental education. And that's by reinforcing the role of the private sector and partnership with civil society. We have to calculate the cost of Egyptian education for each student, and then we see who has to pay for it. Public education is free, and for many Egyptian families who can't afford private school fees, it's the only option. Students often complain of poor learning environments, old teaching methods that rely on learning by rote, a lack of new technology and overcrowding. In some schools, classes of 80 are not unheard of. And that sparked a new generation of activists and bloggers. If we say education will change now, we're kidding ourselves. We have to start by training teachers, building more schools to lower the class numbers and improve teachers' salaries so that they don't have to give private lessons at home. That is putting too much financial burden on families so students don't get quality of education at school. Many Egyptian families spend a lot on private tutoring. Teachers argue that they have to supplement their wages and they're still fighting to improve their pay and working conditions. Another major problem is what's being taught in the classroom. There are attempts to change the curriculum in general to suit the Arabic Islamic nature of Egyptian society better. Although Muslims are in the majority in Egypt, Coptic Christians are also taken into account. The Education Ministry recently integrated verses of the Bible in its human rights textbooks. Whether Muslim or Coptic, students want to see real change and a future different from what they had in the past. It looks as though, so far, state education hasn't changed much. And some of the educational problems are really basic, like literacy rates. According to UNESCO, in 2010, only around 65% of women and 83% of men are literate in Egypt. Around 17 million people can't read or write in Egypt, according to the latest government statistics. Despite the efforts of government bodies and NGOs, illiteracy remains one of the principal problems facing Egyptian families. And it's hardest felt in the most underprivileged areas where the situation for women is even worse. 
I have five brothers and my parents didn't want to send me to school. They're very conservative. In the church nearby, there used to be reading classes, so I joined. Now my level is like top class of primary school. I found it really useful. Now I can read the newspaper, I can understand what's said on TV, and now I can take part effectively in discussions with others. <laughs> This school is one of the projects launched by the UNESCO office in Cairo and Beirut in collaboration with the Ministry of Education and Literacy under the campaign slogan, Together We Can. It's among many initiatives that started in 2011 and continued after the revolution in Egypt. But there are still significant challenges, not least an exploding population, which has doubled in the last 30 years. We aim to offer an integrated package of services, knowledge and life skills which can help them not only to read and write but also to be productive citizens who can make a living, know their duties and rights and know what they have to offer society. Sewing classes are among the many activities offered by the Together We Can campaign, which is not just about reading and writing but also about finding a job. This campaign aims to eradicate illiteracy by 2020. That might seem a long way ahead, but for many, this project has already changed lives. Inam is now a teacher, but there was a time when she couldn't read nor write. The difference between then and now is that at that time my eyes were closed. I didn't understand anything before. So I learned and wanted to give others what I didn't have. I feel so happy when I teach others and if someone asks me, are you going to be patient teaching us? I say, of course I will. And even though Egypt won the International Prize for Literacy in 1998 and 2010, it's still on a United Nations list of countries with the highest illiteracy rates. But it's not all gloom and doom. One of Egypt's most prestigious institutions, Cairo University, has maintained its position in the top 500 of the Shanghai University rankings. But do their courses correspond to the job market? Cairo University, one of the oldest in the world. There are more than 180,000 students spread over 26 faculties. In the past, graduates from the top faculties got hired instantly, and nowadays graduates from medicine and pharmacy always find employment in government jobs. The problems face those from other faculties because of the sheer number of students, 40,000 in the Faculty of Commerce, for example. There simply isn't that number of jobs in the market. The university has a central library spread over six floors that's home to up to a million books and other sources of information. The library also has a museum, which includes many of the manuscripts and letters written by Napoleon and several rare artifacts and relics. First-year students still have a positive outlook for the future, but graduates without a job in their field were not hard to find. Someone getting good grades won't have a problem, but a student with a low academic performance would have trouble finding a job related to his course. Teaching nowadays has changed a lot from how it used to be in the past. Mahmoud also qualified from the commerce faculty but couldn't find a career among his speciality. So he travelled abroad, learned hairdressing and returned home to open a barber's shop. I had no luck finding a job for several years under the old regime. So, like many others, I had to travel to look for a job, because jobs here are based on favouritism. I travelled to Rome, where I found a job as a hairstylist. Then I came back to my country and opened up my own business, along with my two brothers. Facebook fans think that in education nothing has changed since the revolution. 
Do you agree or is your experience different? Do let us know. Well, that's it from us here in Cairo. Goodbye for this week. Learning World in association with WISE, an initiative of Qatar Foundation.